Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me here to, to Rio. Um, I feel very privileged to be here, um, particularly when I, I look at the subject matter of the conference and then look at what I'm speaking on, and it seems to be a bit of an odd fit. So um, please bear with me. Um, so um, I'll begin. Okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, wander around a little bit because I feel quite uncomfortable just sitting and making a presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about Lance Armstrong. Um, Lance Armstrong is obviously the, the American cyclist whose world has really come tumbling down following his admission on the Oprah Winfrey show. Uh, and I'm going to look at the, the reasoned decision against Lance Armstrong that was produced by the United States Anti-Doping Agency, USADA. Um, my contact details are just here, and if you, if you, um, Edgard will have the presentation, so you'll be able to get some of the live links from the presentation too, if, if, if you want them. Okay, so Lance Armstrong, there he is, uh, looking suitably fearsome. Um, what, a, what a wonderful career he had. He, uh, he was you know, the, the pinnacle of his sport. He won the Tour de France seven times, and he, he, he went from, from the highest that he could possibly be to that. You know, where did it all go wrong for him? He was, um, he's been exposed as a cheat and a liar, hence the, the Pinocchio, uh, the, the, the Pinocchio picture just there. Um, in order to understand, I think, what's happened with Armstrong, and this is a, about the rights of an individual, I guess, against the rights of, the, uh, of, of sport to be drug-free, um, you have to understand his background. Uh, he was a, a precocious youngster. He, he wasn't the typical... Um, he wasn't a typical drugs, a drugs cheat. He didn't come from nowhere to be suddenly the best. He was, as I, as I said, he was a precocious talent. He was the world champion in 1993. This, this is actually a live link to the, uh, to the internet, but unfortunately we don't have internet access here. So, so, so I, I can't link to that. I'm oh, sorry. That, that's okay. Um, so he was world champion in 1993. And then of course the, the, the event happened that really changed his life. His, his cancer diagnosis in, in, uh, in October of 1996. Um, and he, he was given a 40% chance of living. He had testicular cancer, and then that cancer spread to his brain. And it seemed he was going to die, but he didn't. And he came back. 1998 was a dramatic year for the Tour de France. In 1998, the greatest team in cycling had a, a massive drug scandal, the Festina drug scandal, in which the best team in the Tour de France, their team car was stopped as it crossed the French border, and it was searched, and files and files and files and samples of drugs, EPO, testosterone, lots of other drugs were found in the team car. They then raided the headquarters of Festina in Lyon, and more samples were found. And it almost caused the end of the Tour de France. That 1998 tour was massively significant. It led to the development of the World Anti-Doping Agency, the WADA. And for cycling in particular, it was significant, obviously. It meant something had to change. And there's a quote here, professional cycling desperately needed a knight in shining armor, and he duly arrived for the reputation of the sport he needed to be seen to be clean. That knight in shining armor, that individual, that new superstar was Lance Armstrong. And it, 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 it became part of the Armstrong story. And in order to understand why he was able to get away with it for so long, you have to understand how important he was to cycling and how important it was for cycling that he didn't fail. The 1999 tour, so the tour after the Festina scandal, was actually called the Tour of Renewal, the Redemption Tour. 
And it was all about the Lance Armstrong story. You know, and what a story it was. That's him lying in his hospital bed. That's what he went from 1996 to that, to that, and finally to that, the all-American superstar, the greatest cyclist, certainly in the world at the time, arguably in, in history. But almost, pretty much right from the word go, there were rumors about Armstrong. There were suggestions that he wasn't clean, that he was doping, he was taking illegal performance enhancing drugs. He had four positive tests in the 1999 tour. So the very tour of renewal, Armstrong tested positive four times, but these weren't released. Details of these were not released. In 2001, he had a failed test in the tour of Switzerland. That was only dealt with by a backdated prescription. So they got a prescription for therapeutic reasons and they backdated the prescription in order to excuse Armstrong from being guilty of taking performance enhancing drugs. And then we had a, a, a very famous incident. Uh, a cyclist called Felipe Simeone test, testified in court against an associate of Armstrong's. And it led to this associate of Armstrong's being found guilty. Armstrong was a very, very calculating individual. He was a bully. And he bullied Felipe Simeone. And it led to a very famous incident where Armstrong put the zip across his mouth, essentially telling Simeone, you must be, keep quiet. You must maintain the code of silence in cycling around performance enhancing drugs, the code of omerta. And uh, this, this was actually captured on, uh, on, on camera. And this is Armstrong joking about it and showing what he did with Simeone. Tour d'étape, un sixième tour en vue. Au-delà des chiffres, Armstrong s'est aussi se montré humain. Making it very clear, do not testify. Do not let people know about the, cu the culture of taking performance enhancing drugs in, in cycling. But Armstrong's success continued. He attained absolute, the status of greatness in cycling. He won his fifth Tour de France. Only Jacques Oncotil, Eddie Merckx, Bernardino, Miguel Indurain before him had attained five victories. Armstrong was the, uh, was the second after Indurain to actually win five successive tours. And then victory number six, another incident that began to gnaw at the Armstrong armor. He won his, as I said, he won his sixth victory. And this then led to an arbitration hearing. SCA arbitration, the SCA arbitration hearing, which I'll talk about in a second. Then, of course, his seventh victory and his subsequent retirement. And you think, where can he go from here? Well, he clearly made a mistake. He came back in 2009 and 2010. He finished third in 2009 and 27th in 2010, and that was the end of his, uh, his professional cycling career. In terms of the significance of uh, the SCA arbitration hearing, SCA are an insurance company. They provide insurance against freak sporting events from happening. So in other words, if a, one of these freak events happens, obviously Armstrong or somebody else is going to get an awful lot of prize money. And the, uh, the organizers of these prizes may organize insurance against that kind of thing from happening. Well, SCA provided insurance, as I said, against one of these freak sporting events, which was Armstrong winning his sixth successive Tour de France. Remember, it had never been done before. That's why it was considered to be a freak event. And there was a suggestion that if they're going to pay out for this freak event, then the event had to have been won clean. But the problem was there was all these rumors surrounding Armstrong and therefore SCA were reluctant, reluctant to pay out the insurance money. Around about $5 million, I think it was. Armstrong took them to court. There was an arbitration hearing and Armstrong, under oath, committed perjury. He was asked very clearly, have you ever taken performance enhancing drugs? And as we know, he denied and denied and denied. And this was under oath, so he's committing perjury here. So suddenly, 
this didn't become just a, a significant sporting event. It became a significant legal matter. And uh, after the Oprah Winfrey show, the very guy who actually questioned him in the arbitration hearing under oath answer, uh, you know, spoke rather, uh, rather wryly when he said, when he sends an apology, he needs to include a check for the money. Because obviously they never pay that. So, um, so where did that leave Armstrong? Well, Travis Tigard, the head of the United States Anti-Doping Agency, USADA. You almost get the feeling that it was almost a personal mission of Tigard's. Tigard really went after Armstrong. And Armstrong obviously wasn't a weak opponent. But nevertheless, Tigard brought the whole wrath of USADA and of WADA against Armstrong. And Armstrong fought back. Armstrong actually took Travis Tigard to court in Austin, in Texas, Armstrong's hometown, trying to stop the USADA investigation into what Armstrong was doing. So he had, on the one hand, Lance, on the other hand, Travis Tiger. It became a very, very, very personal issue. Armstrong, as I said, challenged whether Tiger and USADA actually had authority to bring a case against him. He suggested that it was the UCI, the governing body of cycling, that had authority rather than USADA. He also suggested that his license to cycle was with the UCI and not with the USADA. And therefore, again, that meant USADA had no authority to bring the case against him. He also suggested that actually it was the UCI that had discovered his doping offenses. Although I think anyone with a television set who was interested in Oprah Winfrey obviously could have discovered his, his, his doping offenses. And he had suggested the UCI, remember the governing body of cycling, had not delegated their authority to USADA. So again, USADA had no jurisdiction to bring the case against Lance Armstrong. And he also suggested that they'd actually breached their own rules anyway by bringing action against him when they're out of time. The statute of limitations suggesting that there's only a certain period of time that they can go back to bring an action against him. He suggested they breach that. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, he suggested there were real issues around due process. Would he get a fair hearing? Would he get a fair trial? And these were the issues that Texas court, remember the Texas court, Armstrong's home court. The Texas court was asked to, to answer really these questions. And they did have some concerns. The Texas court did have one or two concerns, particularly around the issue of due process. They heavily criticized the USADA. They said the USADA's charging letter was woefully inadequate. A real indictment of the abilities of USADA to bring an appropriate charging document against Armstrong. Although they agreed it was a woefully inadequate charging letter, nevertheless, they dismissed that concern. They said USADA could always bring another charging document anyway. And they also made the point that sporting disputes, wherever possible, should be dealt with by international sporting arbitration, not in domestic courts. International sport and arbitration, that is where they are the experts, that is where sport and disputes should be held. <coughs> Key issues as far as the Texas court was concerned was the rights of Armstrong to have a future career and also to maintain his reputation from his previous career against USADA's interest in maintaining a drug-free sport and rooting out drug cheats, doping cheats, those who wish to take performance enhancing drugs. They also made the point that Armstrong actually has a wealth of options outside of the domestic courts. He can go to the United States Arbitration Association, he can go to the Court Arbitration for Sport, the CAS, he can also go to the Swiss Federal Tribunal, the SFT. The Swiss Federal Tribunal is the Supreme Court in Switzerland, and the Court Arbitration for Sport is based in Switzerland. Therefore, ultimately, it is a Swiss Federal Tribunal that has ultimate jurisdiction over the, uh, the Court Arbitration for Sport. 
So the court concluded, the court finds the USADA arbitration rules are sufficiently robust to satisfy due process. They were, they were happy. They were happy for this, therefore, to go ahead. They also made note that the United States has a sports act. And again, this is a, a, a live link. Um, so if anyone has the presentation, you'll be able to click on that link, and that will take you directly to the United States Sports Act. The United States has a sports act. It's very clear. Congress has enacted this in order to keep sporting disputes outside of the, uh, of the domestic courts. They want to put them through to arbitration. That is where the most appropriate forum for these disputes is. It is only in very exceptional circumstances uh, whereby the domestic courts should be dealing with sporting disputes. And these exceptional circumstances aware there's a possibility of wanton disregard for the rights of the individual. And a couple of really interesting cases, again, these are live links. Mary Slaney was a, uh, was a, a United States athlete, and also Tonya Harding. She was a, uh, a figure skater who got her husband to smash the knees of her nearest rival to try and put her nearest rival out of the Olympic Games. Fascinating story, Tonya Harding. And the victim was Nancy Kerrigan, who had suffered a baseball attack on the baseball bat attack on her knees. It was very unpleasant. Um, and they also made the point, actually, that Armstrong, anyway, has agreed to the arbitration process yeah. when he signed some of his licenses that enabled him to, to compete internationally. Some of those licenses had reference in them to one of the conditions of the license is that you will abide by arbitration processes rather than go into three to domestic courts. So that was the, uh, the, the, the case where Armstrong was trying to get this dismissed. He was trying to stop the reasoned decision that was ultimately produced by the USADA. The reasoned decision of USADA, a very long, very long document based mostly on witness statements, affidavits, and, uh, and other eyewitness testimony. 2012, August 24th, USADA declared lifetime ineligibility against Lance Armstrong. He could not compete at all for the rest of his life in any officially sanctioned sporting event. Um, and he's been trying again to, to, to get around that by going into some triathlons. He's been prevented from doing that because the triathlons are affiliated to the World Anti-Doping Agency. So complete lifetime ineligibility and interestingly the disqualification of every single one of Lance Armstrong's results since first of all was 1998 so going back almost 15 years and that's quite quite significant they charge him with well they threw the book at him they charge him with everything they could possibly charge him with use and or attempted use of performance enhancing drugs possession of prohibited substances, trafficking, administration and or attempted administration of performance enhancing drugs, assisting, encouraging, aiding, abetting, covering up, etc, etc, etc. So Armstrong really did have the book thrown at him. And this one was quite important, the, um, the, the covering up, because this enabled the USADA to go back beyond the normal statute of limitations. The World anti doping Agency Code has a statute of limitations of eight years. They cannot go back any further than eight years under normal circumstances. With Armstrong, they went back 15 years. And the reason they were able to do that was because fraudulent misrepresentation, covering up, eliminates the statute of limitations. It means they can ignore it. So, why does Article 17, which very clearly says eight years is as long as we can go back, that was overridden by Armstrong's fraud and Armstrong's misre misrepresentation. And also, uh, finally, under um, Article 10.6 of the Wider Code, aggravating circumstances that enables a ban of longer than two years. The typical ban for first offense for doping is two years. This, remember, is really Armstrong's first offense. 
and under normal circumstances, he would get two years. But because of the seriousness, because of everything else around him, it went for much longer. And this is allowed for under Article 10.6 of the Water Code. It's quite interesting that the new Water Code that's coming out in 2015, it looks like a first offence is going to be four years, which is very, very serious for individuals, particularly if they get it wrong, if the anti-doping organisation get it wrong. So it's really important in terms of the rights of individuals that they get these things right. One or two concerns, really, as I said, about the reasoned decision. It is all based on witness statements. It is also based on some very interesting banking records. Lots of transfers of money between Armstrong and Dr. McKaylee Ferrari, the blood, the blood doping expert. Armstrong suggests that they had a very loose affiliation with McKaylee Ferrari, but transfers of, of cash, $150,000, $200,000 from Armstrong to McKaylee Ferrari, from Armstrong to McKaylee Ferrari's son, seem to indicate a much closer relationship than Armstrong was suggesting. Um, also, uh, one, uh, I think another issue that is really important, we have to remember there was no failed test there was no positive test for Armstrong. That means that all of this against Armstrong is based on what is termed non-analytical positives. An analytical positive is a failed test. Non-analytical positives means they have to accumulate other information. Good conventional policing, gathering of evidence. I think one would imagine that under those circumstances, the standard would be beyond reasonable doubt. To satisfy perhaps due process and to satisfy the rights of the individual, this is not the case in doping. In doping, the standard that has to be satisfied is the comfortable satisfaction of the hearing panel. That's based on Article 3.1 of the Water Code. So they only have to demonstrate to the comfortable satisfaction, not beyond reasonable doubt. So I think that, 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 that again, I think, is, a, is an important issue. They looked at Armstrong's association with McKaylee Ferrari, very much a numbers man. Ferrari would look at every single small detail and see how these small details could be improved little by little by little. And really, how they could be improved by taking of EPO, blood doping, taking of other performance enhancing drugs. He had very close association with McKaylee Ferrari. And they, made it, they were very clear in the reasoned decision. McKaylee Ferrari's program involves EPO, the gold standard, really, for, do for doping for endurance athletes. And there's no greater endurance event than the Tour de France. They, had, they, they, they made some, some reference to some really quite significant delivery systems. And it, it's almost comical reading what was happening. And you just think, how on earth did they get away with it? They had a rider. A motorcyclist. He was nicknamed Moto Man, and he would have samples of EPO and other drugs in his in the back of his motorbike, and he would follow the cyclist around the tour, and he would be delivering the, uh, the, the 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 samples of drugs to the team. It was ridiculous. Um, Lance Armstrong took to carrying a thermos flask around with him. Oh, so in the heat of the French summer, he's got a thermos flask. And people question, well, why would he carry a thermos flask? Well, the reason being, EPO needs to be kept cool. Therefore, he would keep it in a thermos flask. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was me and I was in charge of anti-doping policy, if I was seeing lots of cyclists carrying thermos flasks around, I'd think, hang on a second. Lance, can I have a look in that flask, please? <laughs> That's what you do, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? But, but no, that, that didn't happen. But as I said, there was no failed test. There was no smoking gun. Because that's, that's when it becomes clear, isn't it? That's when you think, yes, they have been taking drugs. When you have a failed test. With Armstrong, there wasn't one. And we have to remember, USADA tested Armstrong and his teammates 329 times during Armstrong's Tour de France career. And not one single failed test, except for the Tour of Switzerland one and the four that were rubbed out by the UCI. 
However, then of course, this happened. Uh, do you deny um, um, the statements that Miss Andrew attributed to you in the Indiana University Hospital? 100%. Absolutely. How could it have taken place when I've never taken performance enhancing drugs? Look, how could that have happened? How many times do I have to say it? I'm just trying to make sure your testimony is clear. Well, if it can't be any clearer that I've never taken drugs, then incidents like that could never have happened. Okay. How clear is that? I have never doped. Is there evidence? Where is evidence of doping here? I'm sick and tired of these allegations. I'm sorry. Yes or no? Did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Yes or no? Was one of those banned substances EPO? Yes. Did you ever blood dope or use blood transfusions to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Did you ever use any other banned substances like testosterone, uh, cortisone, or human growth hormone? Yes. So it obviously suddenly became very clear Lance was a cheat. I think you just have to look at that video when he was going so fast to think, there's got to be something wrong. I couldn't go that fast on a motorbike, let alone on a, on a, on a push bike. So it hasn't really ended there for Armstrong. As I said, he's, he's had all his results disqualified since 1998. However, there is now a federal whistleblower case against Lance Armstrong. Floyd Landis, one of his former teammates, has brought this action, very benevolent, benevolently, on behalf of the United States government. And there is a false claims act, a federal act, that allows members of the public to bring an action on behalf of the US taxpayer for any fraudulent issue that has defrauded, that has cost the US taxpayer money. And Floyd Landis is bringing this case because the United States Postal Service, US Postal Service, sponsored Lance Armstrong cycling team for millions of dollars. And Floyd Landis is suggesting in this case that that therefore has cost US taxpayer who funds the US Postal Service a lot of money. So Landis is bringing this action to recover that money directly for the US taxpayer from Lance Armstrong. And it's a lot of money. They think possibly as much as $30 million has been defrauded by Lance Armstrong. And the penalty for this, if Lance Armstrong is found guilty, is up to three times the amount that he has defrauded the US taxpayer of. So potentially $90 million against Lance Armstrong. And of course, Floyd Landis gets a share of that. Remember, Floyd Landis is a former teammate of Armstrong's. He will get between 15 and 30% of that money that is recovered from Lance Armstrong if the case is won against Armstrong. So, very significant sums of money. And the allegation is that Lance Armstrong's drug use was a clear violation of the sponsorship agreement of US Postal with Lance Armstrong and Lance Armstrong's cycling team. Furthermore, all US Postal workers, so all the postmen who deliver the mail, all that stuff, they all sign a morality clause in their contract when they take up their contract of employment. So therefore, the suggestion is that should also apply to individuals that are sponsored by the US Postal Service. Um, and Floyd Landis is also alleging that the contracts between US Postal and Lance Armstrong would contain clauses that required compliance with all anti-doping measures, all anti-doping procedures. So this is, this is really quite serious for Armstrong. Um, U.S. Postal in 2000 made it very clear their rationale for sponsoring cycling was to positive, positively impact customer perceptions of the Postal Service. That's why they wanted to sponsor Lance Armstrong Cycling Team. Furthermore, it was made clear that there was the implication this would be doping free. Armstrong would achieve this by being doping free. And they also suggested that actually, because of Lance Armstrong's status, being this icon of America's sport, he mixed with the movers and shakers. Because of his status, 
that actually facilitated the sponsoring process and that enabled him and his team to get more money from US Postal. Now he was an association of, of Bill Clinton's. He also, with George Bush, <laughs> and furthermore, the complicity with the doping procedures, with the cheating, went right to the very heart of the team. It wasn't just Armstrong, it was the whole team. They were all in it together. Quite interestingly, there was a suggestion by Armstrong and some of the others that one of the reasons why they were doping was actually to keep the sponsors. And you bear that in mind and set that against the rationale for sponsoring. And conventional wisdom is that sponsors don't like drugs in sport. They don't like sports to have a bad reputation. But here, the suggestion is we were taking drugs in order to keep our sponsors. In other words, we were taking drugs to win, and by winning, that's how we kept our sponsors. And perhaps that says something about the sport that you had to take drugs in order to win, and therefore perhaps has much wider implications than merely the Lance Armstrong case. The latest just happened just a couple of weeks ago. Lance Armstrong has offered as a settlement five million dollars. I wish I could just take five million dollars out of my back pocket and say, here you go, five million. But they've turned it down. They said no, we want more than that. So they are really going after Lance Armstrong. So where does that leave him? Well, and where does that leave cycling? There's a saying in the UK, the elephant in the room. In other words, there is a question that everybody wants to ask, but nobody is willing to ask it. And that question is the elephant in the room. And for cycling, the elephant in the room, the question that everybody wants to know the answer to, but no one wants to ask that question, is what did the governing body know? How did Lance Armstrong get away with it for so long? And that's what we all want to know. This guy was the head, the president of the governing body of cycling during Lance Armstrong's glory years. That was uh, Hein Verbruggen. This, Pat McQuaid, the current president of the governing body of cycling. They are directly responsible for what Armstrong was able to do. They are <laughs> the elephant in the room. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, saw it. Shaking, I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> they have some severe questions to answer. What knowledge did they have of Armstrong's doping? There was almost a tacit approval of the doping culture in cycling that Lance Armstrong took advantage of. Dreadful, ineffective testing methods from 1998, really, all the way through until 2007, 2008, when they began to develop the biological passport. It was very clear you were, high, you were highly unlikely to be caught doping. Armstrong was very clear. I made sure I was tested when I knew I was clean. How did he do that? How was he able to do that? Rank incompetence from the governing body, or is it something more sinister? In 1999, there were positives. And what did the governing body do? They swept them under the carpet. They ignored them because they were ruining the, they, they had the potential to ruin the Armstrong story. 2001, the positive test. Again, they were complicit in allowing Armstrong to have that backdated prescription. It was an open secret in the peloton, in the, amongst the cycling fraternity, that Armstrong was a cheat. This was known as far back as 1999. Christoph Bassons was a cyclist in the tour that year. And he was writing a daily article for Le Parisien, French magazine. And he said, after one stage where Armstrong performed pretty impressively, he said that the peloton, the cyclists, were surprised by Armstrong's ability in the mountains. Armstrong attacked Bassons after that, but nevertheless it shows, again, that it was an open secret among cycling that Armstrong was cheating, Armstrong was taking drugs. They then produced a report, complete and utter 
whitewash. There is no drugs in cycling. Armstrong is not a cheat. Absolute, complete and utter load of nonsense. A complete whitewash by this official report from the USADA, uh, from the governing body of cycling. And again, this is, this is a live link, which again, Edgar has, has, has let us down there, but um, there we are. So what were their roles? How responsible are they? That is a, an unanswered question. However, Hein Verbruggen, remember, the president of the governing body of cycling, in Armstrong's peak years, stated very clearly, only in 2011. That's impossible because there is nothing. I repeat again, Lance Armstrong has never used doping. Never, never, never. And I say this not because I'm a friend of his, but he was. I say this because I say it because I'm sure. It is not true, etc., etc. So, Hein Verbruggen. Again, sweeping it all under the carpet. Nothing at all to do with, of course, that Lance Armstrong donated $125,000 to the UCI, the governing body of cycling, in order to help with their anti-doping program. So that obviously had nothing at all to do with the fact that they were happy to take his money and make sure that Armstrong stayed clean. They have followed the same tactics as Armstrong. They have, they have criticized and attacked and attacked and defended themselves and gone on the attack. Whenever they have been criticized, they have gone right back at people criticizing them. They have several libel actions out against former cyclists. There's a very well-respected um, journalist, an ex-cyclist called Paul Kimmich, and he is being sued for libel by the governing body of cycling for suggesting there was drugs in cycling and that the governing body were complicit in Armstrong's uh, doping regime, Armstrong's success. I'll just wind up very quickly now. So, you know, where do we go now? What next? Well, there has been a suggestion of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, we are obviously very familiar with them from South Africa in particular, almost unprecedented in sport. It has been suggested and more or less dismissed by uh, those in authority in cycling. Is there going to be an amnesty? Should we have an amnesty? Well, it sounds again very seductive and very, yes, that, that's a good idea. However, there is no facility for an amnesty in the World Anti-Doping Code. And if we're going to have an amnesty in cycling, what about other sports? What about the clean cyclists who have got competed and been defeated by dirty cyclists, what about those guys who have competed clean their whole lives? So an amnesty sounds attractive, but it has very clear concerns, very difficult issues. Um, so that, that's really what next for cycling, nobody seems to know. Um, it, 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 it certainly promises to be interesting times in the next few months. I'll just leave you with this, this quote, which I find quite interesting. Concerning the USADA and the governing body of cycling, how they have been cooperating or not, the judge in the original Te Austin, Texas court case stated, unfortunately, the appearance of conflict on the part of both organizations creates doubt that the charges against Armstrong would receive fair consideration in either forum, meaning either in arbitration or in a court of law. And that is a terrible, terrible indictment of lack of cooperation between a sporting governing body and the anti-doping agencies who seemingly wish to maintain or, or make sure there is a drug-free sport. So, thank you very much.